And sometimes that's not how real life is. And I think that's actually what gives this depth and substance and happily ever after. I mean, sometimes life feels more like a series of happily ever almost than it does happily ever afters. And I think that's important to talk about and to explore and to really learn how to navigate. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing, numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Have you ever felt stuck in a season of almost? It's a feeling of straddling where you are now and where you truly want to be, thinking if you could just achieve the goal, reach your own expectations, and finally make that dream come true, everything else would fall into place. Well, my friend Jordan Lee Dooley knows exactly what that feeling is like, and that feeling could have kept her stuck. Instead, she learned through hard-fought battles and personal challenges the importance of finding contentment as well as motivation during seasons of waiting. In fact, in her recent released book, Embrace Your Almost, she talks about how to find clarity and contentment in the in-betweens, the not-quites, and the unknowns. And dang, we have walked through a lot of that together as friends. Now, Jordan was first on the Gold Digger podcast way back in 2017, which is crazy because one, the show has been around that long, but two, her and I have experienced five years of life alongside one another. And I just want to walk through what it is like if you are in this place of feeling like you are almost there or you are there, but not quite, or you're waiting for that achievement or that thing, then this is a conversation for you. And real quick, before we dive on in, I do want to provide a trigger warning. Both Jordan and myself have experienced pregnancy loss, and it is something that has connected us in our relationship as we've journeyed through life together. However, I want to be mindful that if you are in a season where this sort of conversation on this topic is not helpful or could potentially be hurtful for you, I highly encourage you to hit pause on this episode and revisit any past episodes of the Gold Digger podcast for your listening today. I want to be mindful that I understand that this is a delicate topic. And while we thoughtfully talk about it in today's episode, I wanted to provide that warning for you so that you can discern where you are at in your own journey. And I want you to know that we are thinking of you. Without further ado, let's dive on in with Jordan Lee Dooley. Do you need a new show to add to your rotation? Please do not miss No Straight Path hosted by Ashley Menzies Babatunde, brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network. Ashley is shedding light on the stories behind the shiny resumes, social media highlights, and job titles, humanizing success from the millennial perspective. Featuring guests from all walks of life, No Straight Path aims to inspire conversations around the nuanced perspective of success. Ashley recently dug into the topic of fulfillment with Sabrina Merchant. If you've ever wanted to make a hard pivot and pursue something completely new and different in your life and career, you need to listen to that conversation. Listen to No Straight Path wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, for this guest, this feels so weird because we talk on a almost daily basis via voice notes. So to sit down in a formal interview feels kind of funny, but also amazing. Welcome Jordan Lee Dooley to the podcast. Uh, it's so true. I'm like, <laughs> how do we do this? <laughs> oh, I know. It's so funny. Whenever horrible. Drew can hear your voice memos, he's like, are you listening at 2x speed? And I'm like, no, Jordan just talks fast <laughs> and I listen faster. It's totally great. We have been so connected, so crazy connected over the last few years. Mm -hmm. I would say 2020 really brought us together Mm -hmm. in some not great circumstances, but you and I have walked through a lot of life together. Mm -hmm. So I know everything about you, but for those who (laughs) don't know who you are, which would be shocking to me, 
Give us a little snippet of Jordan Lee Dooley and who she is, and then we'll dive into yeah, the good well, stuff. Thanks for that fun intro. <laughs> I, I do talk very fast, so I have to purposely slow down on podcasts. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I often refer to myself as a multiple hat wearer. I write books. I host a podcast as well. I have a few programs that I run, coaching programs, and I'm a wife and dog mom and now like an amateur gardener. I've gotten into gardening recently and that has been quite the adventure. So I share a bit of my journey just with wellness and with gardening as well as business and all the things on the internet. So I feel like we share very similar passions in many ways. So <laughs> yes, we do. And it's really awesome because I feel like there are places in our lives where like one of us is in front of the other in terms mm -hmm. of leading and the other one is following and in both ways. And it's just this beautiful give and take. You recently launched, released your second book called mm -hmm. Embrace Your Almost. Talk to me about the title, the topic. How did you land on it? Why this book? Give it to me. Yeah. Well, it's funny because the book was originally supposed to be called something else. And wait, you know, tell me what the working title was because I love working titles. <laughs> so the original thought was, so my first book was Own Your Everyday. Yeah. And so then the next book, and there's similar themes that still come through in this book. It's just kind of it evolved. And so the original working title was going to be Own Your Ambition. And it was going to be really about like, what does success really mean? You know, not necessarily owning your ambition in the way we often think about it, but more about like, what's right for you, owning your ambition. What do you really care about in a world that's constantly telling you you can have it all? That yeah. still comes through in the book. But as I was writing it, I walked through a pregnancy loss, which was kind of unexpected. So that shaped a little bit of the story and just my perspective on some of that even took it a lot deeper. And then as I was finishing the manuscript, I actually was three months pregnant. And so I finished this work, if you will, <laughs> with kind of this like tied up little story where I kind of took it this direction of the cliche, hey, if you just get up and try again, things will work out. And so I turned that in on June 1st of 2020. And nine days later on June 10th of 2020, I found out I shockingly lost that pregnancy too much further along. And so it completely blew up not only the timeline for the book, because now I had to go back and rework it, but also my expectations for my life. And so the book all of a sudden became a book about maybe not such a cliche, like, hey, if things don't work out, just get up and try again, to really digging into something that it's hard to talk about. But what happens when you get up and try again, and things still go wrong? What do you do when you do all the right things, and you still don't get the outcome you thought you would? How do we navigate that well? And so this idea of almost really kind of yeah. just was born out of a season of a lot of almost because that was also right in like the intense beginning of COVID. And so there were so many almost, almost a wedding and then people had their weddings pushed back and almost a promotion, but then getting laid off. And so in my own life, there were personal almost like almost having a baby multiple times. And then there were also some professional almost. We had to you know, go back and redo business plans and pull launches and change things and switch directions. And so it just kind of evolved into that. But I felt like it was probably a more relatable message as a result because I think we hear the cliche, just get up and try again all the time. When sometimes what we need to hear is like, what do we do when we try again or when our best efforts still land us just shy of where we thought we'd be? Uh. It's so powerful. And I sometimes get frustrated when we're working on work and God or the universe gives us these themes or these things where we're like, and I am still a student mm -hmm. and I am still learning. But I think it is beautiful because you really are processing and working through this alongside of your reader, which is yeah. really what happened. Yeah. Yeah. It really became, it was originally, you know, a book that had, you know, and again, those themes still come through for the original concept, because I really found that through almost and through the subsequent uncertainty that follows unmet expectations, broken dreams, you know, plans going sideways, they're in those experiences, they often feel like obstacles. But I really found as much as some of them were very painful for me, they also served as opportunities to get really clear on where am I going? You know, and why am I going there? And what really matters? And what path do I need to be on? And where do I need to maybe prune some things or release some things and really get focused? And so in an odd way, you know, it still kind of kept some of those similar themes. And I didn't expect that. But I really just found sometimes those setbacks, those unmet expectations, those broken dreams, 
they really do hold a unique opportunity to really get clear on what's right for you and what's not in a world that's constantly telling you what you should do or should want. And, you know, I think it was just ironic because it was kind of evolving into a book about the middle and the uncertainty and getting clear. And then I ended up writing the whole thing and launching the thing from the middle, you know, like I thought we'll be out of this. And then it was like, we're still kind of dealing with a lot of uncertainty. And that was a challenge. But I think in so many ways, it was also a gift because it allowed me to really walk alongside my reader from a place of understanding and a place of I'm just one step ahead of you in this journey. I'm not 10 years removed going, oh, yeah, back when, you know, I walked through some valleys. It was like, no, we're in this together. So, yeah, you know, It's really interesting, Jordan, because I feel like a lot of times, and we both, you know, are women of faith, where it's like we want to write this like redemption song. Like we want to be like, look, look at God, like look at this happened. And, you know, I know with my own losses, you know, I was very public in sharing about our first one. And then I thought, oh, this second pregnancy is going to be this beautiful moment of like, and look at the redemption Mm -hmm. here and look at this. And I know you and I both went through very similar emotions of almost just anger Mm -hmm. during the second loss of like, why is this happening? And what is going on? And what is my body going through? And all of these things. And so even as you were launching the book, and there was kind of this vision of like, oh, how cool would it be to be on the other side by Mm -hmm. the time this comes out to really give that redemption the breath that it requires and deserves, I think it was a blessing in disguise because you were able to speak to this message from such a beautiful place of still being in it. Yeah. You know, I I think sometimes, especially as creatives and storytellers and writers, we tend to pencil in our own redemption story. And and it's not, you know, it's not even unreasonable to do, especially when it appears that that's the way things are going, you know, like when it looks like that's very reasonable to assume, like I was 11 or 12 weeks pregnant when I turned in my manuscript, I thought we're good, you know? (laughs) So to, to have kind of all of those expectations disrupted, not only from the perspective of writing it, but also just even thinking, oh, well, by the time it comes out, I'll be out of this or one thing or the other. And that wasn't the only almost, it's not a book about loss. Those are just some of the, some of the stories that were pivotal for me. You know, I agree with you. I do think there's, you know, there's purpose in even the things that we wish were different. And there's a connection point because realistically, you know, we want this, we want things to be tied up with like a pretty little bow, but much of life isn't like, and it's, or or it isn't in the timeline that we expected it to be. You know, we think if we just follow these steps or get these answers or do these things. And I think, I don't know if you can relate to this, but I think as an achiever type of person and someone who has built a lot of things that have worked and been successful, I think I translated a lot of my experience professionally to how things would go personally, meaning like I got used to thinking if I just, you know, set the goal and do all the right things, like the outcome will be great, you know, and and sometimes that's not how real life is. And I think that's actually what gives this depth and substance and happily ever after. I mean, sometimes life feels more like a series of happily ever almost than it does happily ever afters. And I think that's important to talk about and to explore and to really learn how to navigate. Oh. That's so, so powerful. You referenced gardening and you mentioned pruning. Tell the story about pulling the weeds because I just think this is so powerful and it's this illustration of what a lot of us can go through and might be going through right now. Yeah. So in the book, I share this story because a couple of months, I want to say it was probably three or four months after my second pregnancy loss. And at that time, we were also considering selling our home, which we thought was going to be our dream home. But we were just really reevaluating like, where does our effort and energy need to be and remodeling an old home and keeping up at a big property just felt like it was adding a lot of stress to our life. But facing this, this idea of possibly releasing this home that was going to be our forever home where we were going to turn it into where we raise our family. Like that was another almost in some ways. And then my book getting pushed back. Like there was all these things that summer that just felt like everything had fallen apart. And I was really starting to struggle with the lies of my dreams are never going to work out for me. It's somehow all my fault. Like I must be being punished. God's forgotten about me. Like all the things. And I was seeing a counselor, a therapist at the time, and she said something to me that really stuck with me. She said, be careful how often or how many times you think something because it only takes 200 thoughts to become a belief. And once it becomes a belief, it's really hard to like get out because it kind of takes root in your life and in your mind and in your heart. 
And so anyways, for whatever reason, one day I was pulling weeds because we had gotten really behind on yard work because we had many other pressing things in life to tend to before that. And we had some big planting beds on this property that we owned. And some of the weeds had gotten like mini trees. You know, those, I don't know if you guys have ever seen those, but like they were almost as tall as me. And I was trying to get these weeds out. Matt was mowing the grass. They were not coming out. And for whatever reason, I just, what my therapist said to me came to mind. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to assign each one of these weeds a lie, a lie that I'm believing or that I've been struggling with. And so I found one of the bigger ones and I was like, this is the lie that this will never work out for me. And at that point, I was really thinking about like motherhood specifically. And so somehow, I don't know how, but there was some sort of like new level of determination that came. And so I went to like go pull this weed out and I somehow found the strength to get it out when five minutes before I wasn't able to. Mm -hmm. And I pulled so hard, I like almost fell on my back. And I was so pumped. I like started doing like a dance. And Matt's looking at me from the other end of the yard like, what are you doing? But I kept doing that. Like I went weed by weed. There was like five or six really big ones. And I just assigned each one a lie. This is the lie that God's forgotten about me. This is the lie that it'll never work out for me so on and so forth. And there was something empowering about that. And it was a turning point for me. I wouldn't say that immediately overnight, I no longer, you know, ever struggled with those thoughts again. But what it did do is it kind of gave me this like sense of strength again. And it was like, I no longer just felt like this fragile victim, like who just had everything go wrong in her life. It was like for the first time in probably six months or more, I... I had this realization that I do have some say over what I allow to take root in my life and what I'm willing to believe and what I absolutely won't. And so that was really a powerful exercise for me. And I think this can be done in so many ways, whether it's pulling weeds or decluttering our closet and throwing away old things. Like Sometimes getting stuff out of our head or our hearts, it's helpful to do something physical with that. Yeah. And so anyways, that was a very big moment for me just to kind of shift from consistently thinking those things to I have some say over what I allow to take root in my life and what I won't. Mm. I just think that story is just so powerful. And I love thinking about, yeah, putting something physical with it. I feel like there are studies that show even like the more senses you can incorporate into something, the more deeper it'll stick with you. And so I love that. One thing I wanted to ask you, because I've never actually been able to ask you this in our 8 million voice notes back and forth (laughs) to one another is can you offer any advice for anyone when it comes to friendship where the person that you are in friendship with is in a different stage of life than you or is living something that you want? I think you and I have done, at least I hope, a really beautiful job of blending where we're at, where you're at, my own experiences, Mm -hmm. both in the past, but also in the present and leaving space for it all to exist with this Mm -hmm. deep level of empathy. Can we talk about that for a minute? Yeah. You know, I think some of the hardest moments are when it feels like your dreams are coming true for everyone around you, but you, and that can create some tension in friendships for sure. And I think one of the most important things is like you said, leaving the room for both to exist. And so one thing that I found is, you know, for example, in the context of pregnancy loss or not being in the season you thought you'd be, I found it really helpful in my experience. And I've had to learn this now, like I take note for this going forward. And I had to learn this even with in other circumstances, like when I would have mom friends who, where they felt like they could, I guess the best way to say this is there was a safe space or an open space to talk about their kids, talk about their season of life, but the whole conversation didn't revolve around that, right? Like they were aware to say, and what else is going on? Tell me about work. You know, it was a really balanced conversation. Those kind of things can be really helpful just because otherwise when someone's finding themselves in a season where they're grieving the very thing that you are really caught up in or happy in or celebrating, it can be hard to connect, you know? And so just that intentionality to make sure that the conversation is a little bit balanced. It's not to say you should hide anything good in your life by any means, But I think when you're on the side of the friend who's got the good thing or is celebrating something that your friend is mourning or struggling with, to just really be intentional to ask, you know, and and show awareness of that can be so helpful. And then on the flip side, you know, I think I had to learn there's been in my own life, like I have several single friends who struggle with that. And I know like I'm a season ahead of them in that way. And so I've had to take note of that and just say, okay, how can I be intentional to make sure those conversations are balanced and that I'm, you know, sharing my own experience, but not crowding the conversation with talk about marriage or one one specific thing. So that's kind of just one thing that I've learned. And then the other thing is 
when you're on the side of the friend who may be in that pit or in that season of, I'm not where I thought I'd be, or I feel like you're ahead of me, or I'm struggling, you know, with one thing or another. So often it's so tempting to see where someone else is. And it feels like a reminder of what's painful or what hasn't worked out. And I remember this happened to me one day. It was like the summer, everything went sideways in my life. And a few months into that, I got multiple texts actually in a row. Like one friend was telling me she was pregnant. Another friend was telling me she like had this amazing win in her business. And I had hardly touched my business that year because it was everything was a mess. And I just remembered feeling like a double whammy and I was really struggling with it. So I t- you know, unplugged, took some time to just go like hang out by the water. We were on vacation. And there was the thought that came to me that I actually wrote in the book because I think it's important to remember is that is a reminder of what's painful. Yes. But we can also choose to see it as a reminder of what's possible. Mm -hmm. And so trying to just hold the both and like, yes, but it's not just like, there's not like this limited scarcity of husbands to go around or promotions to go around or babies to go around. Like this idea that like, if it happened for them, it therefore won't happen for me or their success is therefore my failure. Like, kind of trying to remove that and just remember like, yeah, right now it feels like a reminder of what's painful, but can I also dare to believe that it's a reminder of what's possible? So Mm. those are just a few things that I think help from both sides of that coin. With customer expectations at an all-time high, showing customer appreciation is more important than ever. From special discounts to customer gifts, there are a million ways to show customer love, but the one way you will always win is showing them you value their time. From the moment they engage, make things easy, like food delivered to your door without leaving the couch easy. HubSpot's intuitive payment tools are just one of the ways that you can help your customers have a painless purchase experience. With full access to payment data, your team gets the full customer story, meaning they can provide the best possible service. And with directly embedded payment links, your customers can seamlessly purchase and pay from emails, live chats, and more. Learn more about how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. How many times have you thought to yourself, I should start a podcast? Maybe you've got a voice backed by passion, a knack for storytelling, a penchant for entertaining, a gift for listening and asking those really good questions. No matter what your specialty is, there's a reason you're feeling pulled to the podcast space. So listen to those words. That's the universe maybe telling you something. You should start a podcast. Lean in and make a move. It's time to hit record and host your own show. I can help you craft one from scratch. Snag my totally free guide for podcasting beginners at jennacutcher.com slash start a podcast. That's jennacutcher.com slash start a podcast for my beginner podcasting guide. I think that's so powerful. And I think you know, female relationships are tricky enough as it is, right? Like, I feel like there is this hunger for like deep relationships among women. And yet a lot of times people, you know, wait to be contacted or wait for someone to send the text or wait to have somebody reach out to them and ask them how they are. Mm -hmm. And I think what you said is really beautiful too, where it's like, don't avoid... Mm -hmm. sharing what's going on in your life, but do it with this level of empathy. And I recently shared Mm -hmm. something and and some people disagreed with it, which was totally fine. But I think a lot of times when someone we know or love is going through a really hard thing, it's really easy to say, oh, I can't imagine going through Mm -hmm. that. And it's like, no one wants to imagine these Mm -hmm. awful things that people are dealing with. And one of the language switches that I've really had to, you know, honor and invite into my life is like, Mm -hmm. try to imagine just Try to imagine because even if we don't have the shared experiences of our sisters, we've all felt all of the emotions at times. I learned this from an emotional intelligence practitioner, Tico Nejan, who's incredible. Mm -hmm. And she was saying, she was saying like, we've all felt grief or we've all felt Mm -hmm. shame or we've all felt left out or we've all felt disappointed. Even if you haven't been in that particular instance, you felt that feeling, you can share that emotion and that's how we connect with one another. And I just think it's a encouragement for women to not shy away from relationships if your friends or loved ones are in different positions, but try to imagine, try to imagine the joy they feel Mm -hmm. when they have that gift that you so deeply want. Try to imagine. And so I really had to reframe that because even for me in my own journey with loss, like I am on the other side of it, but I can imagine because I have lived it. 
And so it's one of those things that I think can connect us in a world that is really feeling disconnected these days. Yeah, I would so agree with you. I think there's a lot, honestly, conversationally, and when it comes to word choice and communication that, I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges is so often, I remember when I was going through my losses and just in a season of one thing after the other going wrong, so many people would say to me, I'm so sorry, I don't know what to say. Like this feeling of like afraid to say much because we don't want to say the wrong thing. And I think that there's some help to that. Like we don't want to just try to like offer, you know, platitudes and, and say things that could actually be more hurtful. But I think even just like, I don't know, this is just another language shift that was helpful for me. But when friends would say, I'm here with you versus yeah. I'm here for you, that made me feel like you're in it with me. Like you're willing to sit in the in the crap because it often made me feel like a burden or like they're here for me, but like they don't, they yes. can't even connect on the emotions that I'm feeling. And so even just to shift your language, just from saying, hey, I'm here for you or or even asking what can I do? Most people don't even know that. So I just think when when you're trying to show empathy and support, instead of saying what can I do or I'm here for you, say I'm here with you. Let me know if you want to if you want to talk or I'm here to listen. And then another really helpful thing is to say is to just offer to do something and to yes. give them a very simple choice. So like, hey, I know this season's been tough for you. I'm picking up ice cream and dropping it off. Do you want chocolate or vanilla? Like, yes. Don't make it complicated for them to give you like some sort of task that would be helpful. Because honestly, if they're going through something hard or feeling lonely or if they've been in a long season, they may really appreciate a little pick me up like ice cream or just you showing up and giving a hug. But they won't know how to ask for that or put that into words because they're just like, nothing can really change my circumstances. So what do you mean? What can you do to help? You know? Yes. Um, So anyways, even just shifting your perspective, like or or your language from I'm here for you to I'm here with you. I'm in it with you. We're walking this together, even if I'm not sharing the identical experience. And then also shifting from what can I do or how can I help to I'm helping in this way. Would you like chocolate or vanilla? Like making yes. it that that simple is just such a way to show a friend that you care and that you you love them and that you're there with them in it, even if you're not sharing the same experience. Mm. Okay, Jordan, there's a chapter in the book where I had said something to you and it landed on the pages of your book. <laughs> Let's talk about the boot camp because mm-hmm. I think that this idea can really span people's experiences, whether it's relational or parenthood or career related in those seasons of waiting or those seasons of almost talk to me about this notion of boot camp. So I was in a similar, I was in a similar place as I was when I was pulling the weeds. This was all kind of the same, like late summer, early fall after a lot had happened. And I typically, when things don't go my way in life or I'm struggling with something, my natural tendency is to get really busy. Like I just start filling my calendar. I start taking on more, you know, goals or whatever, projects, et cetera. And I remember, I think I I sent you a text about that. And I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. so I find myself feeling weird because I should be raising a baby or getting ready to give birth right now. And instead, I just have a lot of empty space that I had planned for maternity leave and set aside. And now it's just kind of there and I haven't really known what to do with it. And I said, were you ever tempted to like, just get busy? And you you related to that. You were like, yes, absolutely. Like that's absolutely tempting. And then you said something along the lines of, but I truly believe like you don't have to fill it with a ton of stuff. Like this can be your boot camp to learning to be more still and present, which is something you will need like when you eventually do get to the next season. And I just remember that really resonated with me because as somebody who is similar in the work styles and just the way we do things, I was like, okay, if you learn how to do that, I need to learn how to do that because that's only going to benefit me eventually. And so I kind of went from feeling empty and like there was this big void in my life to feeling empowered of how can I fill it intentionally and maybe not try to overfill it to where I'm actually distracting myself with just busyness and busy work and things to do, but actually really filling it with healthy things and things that develop me, things that help me slow down, things that, you know, enrich my life, not just like fill it, you know, with a bunch of stuff. So I kind of enrolled myself in the little boot camp because I just felt like I don't know what else to do with my life right now. I've got enough work on my plate, but I don't want to add more. And I feel like I have all these empty space and free time. And so anyways, I really tried to lean into what that could look like. And I kind of outlined that in the book, but it it was everything from finding a hobby because I was like, okay, I turn everything that I like into work somehow. <laughs> so, yes, um, yes. I, that's when I took up gardening and my first garden was a total flop in terms of the harvest, but it was a great first year just of learning, you know, and that really informed a lot of even what I wrote in the book, just the lessons that come from gardening are so powerful in life. But so I started gardening. I, I took on a habit or a hobby. I 
started doing things that I always wanted to do. I went on a hot air balloon ride. I checked some things off my bucket list. I started serving in my local community. I had a friend actually, I don't know if I ever told you this story, but I had a friend that had told me something a couple years prior. She was in a single season, had been single for a while and was feeling like one of the only people in our friend group who were still kind of in that season. And she came over to my house one day and this was well before my losses and stuff. And she told me, she's like, you know, I've been really struggling with loneliness. So I decided to volunteer at a nursing home. I was like, wait, what? Like, (laughs) what do you mean by that? And she was like, well, I just kind of feel like if I'm struggling with loneliness, how can I show up and help other people who probably feel even more lonely than I do, who don't have anyone to visit them or any community? And she goes, it's actually been really healing. And so I just remember being really inspired by that, but couldn't really relate to it in any way. So then when I was in this season of like, I thought I'd be mothering, I thought I'd have this house, but instead we moved, like my life just looks nothing like I thought it would. We ended up serving with a program called Safe Families, where you take in kids in crisis for temporary respite stays until they can get to a stable place and with their families. And that was scary for me because it was like, I don't know if that's, you know, if that's going to be really hard. And in many ways it was, but it was also really redemptive and healing because I think I held a lot of anger toward kids in many ways. It was interesting just stepping in to serve in the area of your pain is so sanctifying is the way I would describe it. Like not easy, but also can be really healing when done. And I didn't do it immediately. It was several months later, almost a year later. But that was part of my boot camp season was just finding a way to serve that was different from what I was used to and kind of got me out of my everyday routine, got me out of my head. Because I think when we show up in other people's lives, you know, there was other ways that I served too that weren't necessarily volunteer work. Like I hosted friends bridal showers and just tried to do things to get out of my own head. Because I think when we're focused on what hasn't gone right in our life, we just get really stuck in our heads. And so showing up in other people's lives in that way is just kind of, it gives us like a little reprieve from (laughs) worrying about all the things that aren't going right or have been hard in our own life and gives us some perspective too. So anyway, serving, finding a hobby, checking some things off my bucket list, learning new things. I really started learning about things like women's health. And I asked my dad to teach me to play poker. Like I just wanted to learn about things that I was curious about. And so anyway, point being, I just kind of enlisted myself in this season of like, how can I learn new things? How can I, you know, be intentional about using my time to make a difference? How can I, you know, do things that help me slow down, like gardening or having a hobby rather than just working and busying myself? And it ended up being like the most healing thing. But also, I think it made me a more well-rounded person. I think it taught me to slow down without just sitting there doing nothing at the same time. Yeah, it's been really beautiful as a friend watching you navigate this season. And I think for me, you know how they always say hindsight is twenty twenty, mm-hmm. and you're like, can I get to the hindsight part yet? That'd be great. Yeah. You know, I think that a lot of times when we're in those seasons of waiting, it's really easy to waste them because mm-hmm. we're just in that really hard spot. And I tell a story in my book just about how I had this vision for my life that included this little girl and pancakes and all these mm-hmm. things. And when I looked at my life that I was living in that day, there was pieces of it that I could control that were not aligned with the vision that I had for when that vision came true. And it's really interesting because I think, you know, there's a lot of ways in our lives that we delay things and we'll say like, when I have the business, I'll share about this. Or when I have the platform, I'll talk about this thing that's important to me. Or when I have the kids, then I'll travel the world with them. When, 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 and it's like, Mm -hmm. we're disqualifying ourselves from stepping into the identity that supports that greater vision in certain ways, because we can't control everything. There's absolutely no way we can do that. But you have done a really beautiful job of taking control of the things that you can and then focusing on learning to surrender the things that you can't. Let's talk about this idea of surrender because I think it is the hardest (laughs) challenge for us, especially as achievers and control freaks and people who love to create. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Okay. So a couple of things. First, what you just said reminded me of just this concept that I wrote down and it really kind of pairs well with the book. And I just wrote this. It says, don't let a waiting season become a wasted season. Mm -hmm. Don't let the thing that you're waiting on, the promotion, the proposal, the pregnancy, et cetera, find you waiting. When it finally comes, let it find you living. Don't put your life on hold until you get what you're hoping for because your life doesn't start when you get everything you'd like. When it comes, let it find you caught up in the middle of a full, vibrant and abundant life. And I think that's really what surrender looks like in so many ways. It's choosing not to, one, try to control an outcome as much as that's hard to do (laughs) or hard not to do. But two, and even more so, I think it really looks like saying, okay, I can make the most of where I'm at. 
and I can give my best, but I'm not going to put my life on pause or, you know, hold back from going on the trip. Like you said, I have to surrender to the reality of my existence right now. And a lot of times that's when things surprise us, you know, like that's when we'll be pleasantly surprised by something coming together. And that's not to say there's no intentionality with it. Cause I think for achievers, it's scary, this idea of surrender, because it feels like we're just kind of throwing in the towel. Like it feels synonymous to quitting, right. Or giving up when in reality, I feel like I've learned it's, it doesn't mean you stop longing for whatever you're hoping for. It doesn't mean that you even stop pursuing it. It just means that you don't allow it to become your sole focus or hold you back until such and such works out. Because otherwise, we start getting on this hamster wheel or this treadmill of believing when I get X, I'll be happy. When I get X, I'll be complete. right? Or when I get Y, I'll be successful. And if that's what we base our satisfaction, identity, purpose, you know, joy on, we're going to end up missing out on a lot of life. And so it's not that you quit caring about that. It's not that you, you know, quit even, you know, making intentional steps in the direction you're hoping to go. But it just, I think it just means like broadening your perspective rather than being so hyper-focused and obsessed with this one outcome. It's like viewing life more holistically and living life more holistically and saying, okay, you know what? I don't have everything I thought I'd have by now, but I'm going to go on the dang hot air balloon. Like I'm going to, I'm going to do the things that I thought I would be doing when my life finally looked like X, Y, or Z. And right now it still looks like A, B, and C, but you know, I'm going to embrace and make the most of that. And sometimes that's when the things really do work out. I don't know. I guess that's my best answer. It doesn't mean you lack any intentionality. It just means you don't have such a hyper fixed focus on the thing that you're so desperately trying, like, for example, with gardening, part of gardening is surrender. Like you show up and you tend to it as well as you can, but there's like some cucumber plants that just aren't going to grow for whatever reason, right? Mm-hmm. It might be that they're just not in a good spot where they're not getting enough sunlight or whatever. And I, we, we were actually laughing about this the other day because, or last summer, because we have these garden boxes where we're like tending to the soil and like doing all the things to like support the plants. And then we have this little like wash behind our house that's kind of in between us and our neighbor's house that goes down to the pond. And it's just kind of like, I don't know, empty dirt space. It needs to be made prettier, but whatever. And we had this cucumber seed that we ended up not using and we forgot that we had thrown it into that area. And like, lo and behold, that cucumber seed that's not getting watered, does not have good soil, is like growing up against a rock, is growing. This cucumber is growing. And meanwhile, some of the cucumbers we had tended to so closely in our garden weren't growing as well. And Matt just reminded me, he's like, life's going to grow where it's going to grow. And I think that's kind of just the the mentality to take on. It's like, you can do your best and we should do our best. And it doesn't mean we just quit and don't care at all. But it's just surrendering to the reality of like, all we can do is tend to something. We can't control the outcome. And there's some freedom, I think, that comes with that. Uh, I think that is so powerful. I know on my own journey, my word of the year, the year that I was finally pregnant with Coco was surrender. And I literally had to wear it on a chain around my neck to Mm -hmm. hold on to that and to remind myself, like, let go, let go. Because Mm -hmm. I think, you know, a lot of us have gotten to where we are specifically when it comes to business because Mm -hmm. of our control freak tendencies and our Mm -hmm. ability to get stuff done. (laughs) And yes. And when life hands us something that's like, you can't just fix this. It is probably one of the greatest lessons of like, Mm -hmm. you can't white knuckle your way through life. Like you really Mm -hmm. can't. One thing that's fascinating, Jordan, is that you were on my show back in 2017. Oh my gosh. I was like an infant. I don't even Five (laughs) years ago, which is crazy. I mean, one, it's just crazy. You were one of the OGs of Gold Digger. And so thinking back of all that you've been through in the last five years and in our final question, I just want to know if you could go back to that girl five years ago and just tell her about her life and what is going to be coming in the next five Mm -hmm. years, what would you tell her? You know, I think I would tell her, like, be careful how you define success and what you're aiming for, because Mm. it's so easy. And I I think I really lost sight of why I started doing what I was doing from the get-go once it started to work (laughs) and once things started to really take off. And I really got caught up in in the hustle of the next thing and the next thing and the next level and the next this. And not that those things are bad always, but I think if I could go back, I would want to like shake that, like, I don't know, what was I, 22 at the time, probably. My business was just starting to kind of blossom. And I was so like, just willing to say yes to anything and everything. And I think I really drove myself into the ground as a result. And so I think I would just give her the advice of like, hey, there's some hard stuff coming that's going to be perspective shifting. 
But if I could like go back and tell myself something as a warning, I'd be like, be really intentional about what you choose to pursue. And <laughs> don't get caught up in the like, you have to hit the next level and break through to the next level over and over again. Because I think that was part of, I mean, I had to learn that kind of the hard way in my season of like being laid flat on my back and reevaluating a lot of things. So I guess, I don't know if that answers the question, but I would definitely yeah. go back and say like, rethink some of this. Like don't get too <laughs> caught up in that if you could help. <laughs> yeah, I think that's beautiful. And I think that what's been amazing going through life with you is like, we are people who are willing to say, I'm learning and I'm changing mm -hmm. and I'm growing and I'm being stretched. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, but here I am and I'm still showing up. And I think we have to have so much grace for ourselves from years past and also recognize that, you know, five, 10 years from now, we'll look at ourselves now and say, oh, I know. you didn't know. But, you know, That's I feel the like part. <laughs> no, it's the best part because it's, it's like part, but the hardest part. <laughs> yes. We get to show up and be like, here's what I know right now. And mm -hmm. I think that's the beauty of your new book, Embrace Your Almost. Where can everybody find out more about you, get their hands on your book, connect with you online? Give me all of the places. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty easy to find. You can find me at Jordan Lee Dooley on Instagram and jordanleedooley.com is my website where all of the resources are. My podcast is called She and both my books, Own Your Everyday and Embrace Your Almost are available anywhere books are sold, Target, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. So if that sounds interesting. You can grab them there. Amazing. Jordan, thank you for coming back on the show. Let's not wait another five years and maybe someday <laughs> we'll share some of our voice memos back and forth because yeah, that would man, be so funny. That. There's some gold in there. There's some There's gold a there. lot of gold in there. Oh, thank you for being a part of my life. I'm excited <laughs> to see you embrace whatever is to come. Oh, well, thank you as well. You are such a gift and I'm so thankful to get to spend a little time with your community. There's a chapter in my book, How Are You Really?, titled What Brooke Shields Doesn't Know. And it's a chapter about the power of storytelling, the power of showing up and sharing your story with the world and trusting that it will impact people in a way that is beyond your control, in a way of surrender. And when I think about my relationship with Jordan, I really relish in the fact that in sharing some of the hard things we've walked through and some of our losses and the things that we've experienced as women and entrepreneurs and people in pursuit of growing families, we have been able to connect at a much deeper level because we have that shared experience, that level of empathy, and this notion of authenticity in every facet of the way that we show up for one another. And I hope that today's conversation leaves you feeling inspired, leaves you recognizing the gift of telling your story, even when you might cringe about it five years from now, even when you feel like you can't wrap it up in a pretty bow, even when you feel like you are still in the thick of it. I think people like Jordan and myself who are out there doing the work and being willing to contradict ourselves and making mistakes publicly and showing up and sharing not just the highlight reel, but the real, I think that in doing that, we are being brick shields to someone. We are lighting a candle and holding it up for people when their life is dark. And so I just want to encourage you to never disregard the power of story, whether you write a book someday or not, whether you post the photo or not, whether you share your words on a caption or not. I just want for you to know that your story matters. Until next time, gold diggers, keep on digging your biggest goals. And thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 